Boom. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Saki, and we are on site at COFES 2019, the Congress on the Future of Engineering Software for our second annual partnership with them. We are very, very excited. We are now sitting down with the Microsoft Industry Experiences team in cloud and AI engineering. We have Paul, we have Erjank, and we have Diego. Thank you for joining us on the show, you three. Of course. Great to be here. It's very nice to have you. I'm very excited to talk to you guys about what you're working on. I would love to know about your team. You have a crazy amount of experience together somewhere around like 45 years or more of experience in this industry, which is nuts. So teach us about your team while you're here at COFES. Thank you. Uh, so you make me feel old with the with our, uh, our tenure. So yeah, as you mentioned, so I, I lead the uh, the industry experiences team at, at Microsoft. Uh, we sit within engineering, and really, sort of our, our goal is we work across industries. Specifically, in my team, we look at, of course, manufacturing, which is why we're here at CoFest today. But financial services, insurance, retail, and healthcare are also. So we cover the sort of a, a broad gamut in, in my team. Uh, and our goal is really very simple. I mean, number one, we want to understand what we're seeing in terms of trends in industry and opportunity around digital transformation and movement to the cloud. And then the team charter is really focusing on our Microsoft partners and helping them with their move to the cloud. So our end goal is if we think about customer problems and their opportunity and their journey around transformation and disruption is to make sure we have a thriving partner ecosystem effectively solving those problems at a point of mind. And obviously in our case, we're very much focused around the Microsoft Cloud, also known as Azure, of course, uh, and helping make sure we onboard those partners in a good way uh, to, to our platform, our cloud platform, and making sure that they're really delivering value and efficiencies on our cloud to the end customers. Uh, and you know, specifically today and this week at COFES, we're super excited. We are platinum sponsors, so it's great to be here. Uh, a few snippets from the keynote as we kicked off yesterday. It's really nice to, to hear some of the analysts' feedback around sort of Microsoft and our journey and being sort of much more uh, really uh, elevated in, in terms of our maturity around manufacturing. So it was great feedback to hear about you know kind of the respect that we're gaining in terms of our momentum around really be focused on around the industry verticals and in the case of COFES around manufacturing. Uh, so excited to be a sponsor. Ex excited to be in uh, you know sort of part of COFES sort of the the non-conference if you will which is all about the conversations. And you know, that's certainly one of the goals of my team being here this week is how do we immerse ourselves in industry? How do we immerse ourselves with thought leaders in, in manufacturing? How do we learn and how do we take those learnings back uh, to, so we can help in terms of our decision making, evolving our cloud platform. And fundamentally, you know, our goal is to really build connections and be connected to community. One, one of the these crazy keys that you said in there was that there's uh, so many different industries that you are onboarding to the Microsoft Cloud to Azure. And so I'm excited to have you teach us about that a little bit more um, later. Diego, you had a keynote yesterday. You were speaking about the future of manufacturing from the Microsoft view. So go ahead and teach us about that. Okay, yeah. So so uh, as a preface, uh, what we do is uh, under Paul, we have uh, sub-teams uh, that focusing on, on specific industries. And the idea is that, is that we want to go out and interact with, with the industry to make sure that we have all the partners, not just the established ones, but the up and coming and the promising one on our platform. So that requires a significant amount of knowledge and, and interaction with the industry. We're not just cloud vendors, we also understand the industry and, and in our case here in, in this couch is manufacturing. So yesterday I was talking about the, the, the trends uh, in manufacturing and also the our areas of focus. Uh, so we, we, we articulate our point of view on the, on the industry as uh, uh, basically four transformation pillars that are enabled by, by the cloud and, 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 and our platform. So the first one is all about empowering the workforce. And uh, it's more about, about delivering the right information to the workers in the factory floor, uh, delivering, for example, work instructions using, using mixed reality and augmented reality uh, to, to help them execute uh, 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 work instructions or quality control. 
The second pillar is about um, delivering new services. Uh, since now products are connected to the Internet of Things and to the cloud and ingesting data, there is an opportunity for, for manufacturers to deliver attached services like predictive maintenance or uh, optimization uh, that, that were not uh, possible before. So th the, third, the third pillar is all about um, uh, optimizing manufacturing operations. So now that you have all these machines and, and all this equipment connected to the Internet of Things, it's not only about ingesting all this data, but it's analyzing it and providing insight to the people so in the factory floor so they can make decisions on time as opposed to, to guessing or waiting for a decision. And the fourth and, and final p uh, pillar is all about uh, reimagining manufacturing. So that, that speaks more about the, 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 the virtually infinite compute power that you have in the cloud, uh, the kind of things that you can do now with simulation, generative design that you just uh, weren't practical before. So, so we, we establish, we, we define those four pillars and some scenarios under the pillars, and we tell partners, build solutions that align to them. And uh, because we are not a manufacturing software company, we're a platform company. Uh, granted, there are many of our services in the platform that are particularly interesting to manufacturing, like IoT, machine learning, uh, uh, cognitive services, etc. But at the end of the day, we deliver the vision of manufacturing through partners, through software vendors. What, what else was just so interesting when you're describing these four main pillars is that you have on on a on a very on a very like futuristic level you have a mixed reality that is happening inside of the workforce and this is a very major key to hopefully what we see in the education system where we are learning in spatial intelligence in a way that is just helping us retain information and have our awareness expanded to new ways of thinking just much more quickly and um <clears throat> So that's a huge part of this, as well as predictive maintenance is very interesting. All of the sensors that are happening inside on all of the machines and being able to, it's kind of like similar to our biometrics. Like we want to be able to predict pathology before it starts developing and we get sick. So same thing with the machines inside of factories and then all of the data and then reimagining. I, I, the reimagining is such a crucial part of, 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 of both children and adults' lives. When we can reimagine a better world, we can take these incremental steps to figure out how to, how to better get to that, to that goal. Now, all right, with Air Jank, so working with partners, technology trends in general, solving solutions to problems, moving to the cloud, teach us about all of that. I think that's the most exciting part of, uh, of my uh, daily life uh, for me. It, what matters is, is always building something new and uh, working on the cloud, especially on Microsoft's cloud, and looking at the real problems people are talking about here in a conference like COFES is very crucial. So I can go back and work on the interesting solutions that you can put together on the cloud, given the fact that there are many different services that are available on Microsoft Cloud. Um, what I'm doing in my daily life is that we're uh, working really closely with Diego here. Um, my daily life is all about working with the partners that we have, uh, or up and coming partners, and looking there, looking at their solutions and how we can put it on uh, the Microsoft Cloud in the most effective way. Uh, I think the keyword here is the most effective, because um, people can argue that at the end of the day, this is a solution, moving parts, moving technologies. Um, but we were really talking about a huge variety of different like services, choosing the right service and then putting it in the right configuration for solving that problem is usually the key. So that's, um, that's what I focus on. That's where I have the most fun. Um, so uh, examples like when you look at, at the, t the typical uh, situations or typical scenarios in manufacturing and as Diego mentioned, looking from the business point of view, they all point to certain higher level technology problems. Things like, uh, we're talking about analyzing IoT data, for instance. That actually translates into, uh, at the highest level, the first things that you will think, how am I going to store the data? How am I going to process the data? But that is you double click, 
there's going to be more so more more questions like how am I going to secure the data? Mm -hmm. What are the things to uh, make it secure so that only the people who are actually entitled to see the details and the results can actually see it? How am I going to uh, make it more performant? Uh, how am I going to um, make it high available so that whenever I need to access the data, I want to make sure that they, they are there. Uh, so all of those problems are uh, very interesting and fun problems to solve. Yeah, as, as you teach us about data, it also reminds me about all of the, the, the conversations that we've had with, you know, these security leaders at IBM and these other companies where they're explaining to us this, you know, these co-centric circles of security that they put up to, to make sure the data is secure. But then also, like you said, how do you store it? Uh, how do you query it? How do you analyze it? How do you make it most, uh, most relatable to what you're actually working on? that is a very very important process does is it is it okay to potentially say that part of what you do when you work with the partners is you identify what they what they what they need and then you pair them together with your cloud solutions um in a way you can you can say it that way uh the, because if you look at the platform as diego mentioned before we're a platform company we provide subservices that can solve or building blocks that can solve problems. And when you look at the building blocks, um, you can see it both at the variety and also variety in terms of the capabilities, but also variety in terms of the abstraction level. Um, so let's, let's pick up this example of the abstraction level uh, case, for instance. Very typical IoT problem, and when you look at IoT situation on the cloud, is data ingestion. Data ingestion, mean, data ingestion means that there needs to be an endpoint that your data devices are sending the data to, and you need to capture it in a way that you don't lose the messages, but also put them in order, et cetera, and make sure that, um, that that's performant. Um, at the very low, low level, what you can do is that you can choose to have a set of virtual machines with uh, services that are public or that are open source, like, like Kafka or like Flink, and then you can install them there, or you can choose to have a higher level abstraction service that's provided by Microsoft Cloud, which is IoT Hub. So uh, my daily work, my daily life again is uh, going and looking at the partner, have the discussion to make sure that we, so because our, our trade is all about um, uh, trade-offs, right? So you may choose to have uh, you may choose to use this service versus that service, but there's also tons of other things that you should think about. And at the end of the day, your trade-off should be at a point that uh, it's optimum and it's the customized thing for that team. So just technology by itself really doesn't mean a lot. It should also comfort to the team. And I guess that's where we bring uh, the experience uh, uh, at the table uh, together with Diego and the rest of the team so that we can help the partner in the best way. When you speak about the variability in both the capabilities and the abstraction level, that ex really does explain the complexity of what you're dealing with and how to properly get people the solutions they need. Also, you spoke about data ingestion, and, and this, this, this term is very interesting because you think about all of the data that's coming from the IoT world and then how to actually be able to you know make sense of that data and make the actions that you need in order to save the organization money and all these types of um, of a very important things. Now, Paul, um, we have a lot of things happening at Microsoft. This is one of the teams that you're working with. Now, this is your team now. What else is happening at Microsoft at the high level? So that's a pretty broad question. Um, so, I mean, of course, at the core of, of kind of you know, Microsoft uh, and our transformation is cloud. So, you know, cloud is at the, the central of our future. Um, so. I'll kind of talk to within my pair view and my remit sort of what what's happening. So, in number one, I think one of the interesting things is you know if you go back a few years, we were forward thinking in terms of disrupting as Microsoft ourselves, and and so you know obviously over t historically we've been known as a company around things like Windows and uh, Office and so on and so forth, and then forward looking obviously we've transformed to uh, moving ourselves, thinking about business models and transformation to to the cloud. So. 
that's really super interesting is is taking those learnings that we've had to really sort of internally disrupt and so when we're having conversations with customers and partners about that conversation around transformation and disruption we can be sort of genuine in, in that dialogue and we can share our learnings so that's number one i spend a lot of time doing that uh, number two of course the big thing that i would say in our transformation beyond obviously building our cloud platform microsoft azure is really thinking about pivoting to industry. So again, as we think about that that transformation as a, a company, before you know we talk about ourselves as the the you know the technology platform uh, company, but of course we've had to immerse ourselves and, and build much more knowledge around the industry themselves. So um, you know we've we've always had sort of externally focused roles around industry, um, but even internally, you know, as the name implies, with my team, industry experiences, and we sit within engineering within cloud engineering. Uh, we even have built that verticalization there. So that is, is helping us really build that, have much more of a meaningful conversation with industry because we have thought leaders and people who have come from industry. So that helps us not only in sort of external facing activities around sort of go to market and sales, which we've historically done, but also internally as we're building out our cloud platform, having that understanding of what industry needs. Uh, and being able to prioritize capabilities as we build out the cloud platform has been a, a very pivotal change for us. So that's kind of a, a second thing. And third, I think with, um, as we kind of look ahead just across the company, you know, and carrying on this theme of digital transformation, I think having um, real experiences now, so around the, you know, our, our, our cloud platform has matured. So I actually started out in cloud in 2005, talking to analysts about this thing called the cloud and trying to convince them that it was the future. Fast forward to my day job now is talking to a lot of, you know, this thing called the digital transformation officer saying, you know, hey, if you don't have a, a transformation strategy, you know, you better think about it pretty quickly. And so, you know, that, that whole being able to really f be forward looking and having dialogues with customers now and partners around that move to the cloud, having the maturity of our cloud platform, but also having some really, really significant wins in the marketplace now that we can reference. So my point is cloud is not necessarily new anymore. Um, it's now that we need people to kind of play catch up and we need to engage with these digital transformation officers and we need to get out, which is a big part of my role, get out into industry and share our learnings, share knowledge about the platform and how cloud and cloud technologies can help in that transformation. So I'd encourage people to think very, very carefully about understanding that you know it's important to think about transformation, it's important to think about cloud, but also take the learnings from others because there is lots and lots of great, across industries, lots of great learnings. So I, I, you know, I talk a lot about people who, uh, it could be they're looking to transform their business, to building out engineering organizations, to building on the cloud. Fundamentally take advice, bring in experienced leaders that can help in that. You know, and that might be people that are full-time on staff, it might be taking external consult. And of course, closing the loop and looking back at Microsoft, we are a partnering organization. So you know, there's organizations like myself, and we have many, many organizations that are across segmentations of customers and partners and, and kind of roles and responsibilities where our goal is to really build that connection. I mean, historically, we, we are the cloud platform company, but we are a partnering company. And so for us to be successful, our goal, if we think about digital transformation and cloud is how do we kind of really raise the watermark? So how do we make it much easier and simple to take away the complexities of building on cloud? You know, security compliance regulations and so on, that's all hard stuff that we've built over time. You know, today we have you know, uh, 54 regions uh, on, on, as we think about cloud, we have 70 plus compliance uh, certifications. These, these are all built over time across industries. So uh, the point I'm making is we're trying to abstract away some of the, the hard things so that then our customers and partners can really focus on high value IP, focus on their competency, get up and building on the cloud super quick, leverage the capabilities that we're providing on the cloud. So I think that's, as I think about sort of pulling all together, um, you know, myself and, and, and many of us at Microsoft are all about how do we how do we engage in the industry? How do we help our customers and partners? How do we continue to take consult to make sure we're delivering value in our cloud platform that is, is really sort of on point and needed? And how do we share our learnings? And also, I say the takeaway is, this thing called cloud isn't necessarily new now, so there are lots of great experiences. So go take consult, go go take learnings to set your future projects up for success. If I may add, uh, 
another answer to your question and what is exciting that's happening on the Microsoft world and put a spin on the manufacturing industry. Uh, so as Paul mentioned, uh, it's all about increasing the level of abstraction when you're providing services and one exam and also the partnerships. So one example of Microsoft's partnership in the manufacturing world is the partnership with OPC Foundation. Um, Microsoft Foundation. OPC Foundation, that's Yes, so uh, OPC has been around for quite some time. Uh, it's key for a lot of manufacturing uh, organizations. It's all about uh, connecting the devices and machines in a secure way, a performant way, etc. And then over the years, it um, uh, morphed into, or uh, the architecture morphed into the new version called OPC UA. Uh, and uh, one key example here is that Microsoft is the let me, let me try to put it, so English is still my second language, so I'm still working on it. So let me put it in a way. So Microsoft is the organization, uh, single organization that has got the largest uh, or biggest number of lines contributions in open source on GitHub mm -hmm. with a reference implementation showing how you can implement OPC UA services. So if you go to OPC UA uh, repo on GitHub, what you're going to see is that contributions by Microsoft on examples how we can put together an OPC service, uh, different dif uh, different, OP different uh, components on OPC UA. And uh, one of the recent announcements we had uh, during uh, the Hanover Messe International last, last week was that two additional OPC UA services that are that, that, are, that can be used in connected factory IoT uh, solution. Uh, one is OPC UA twin service, and the other is OPC UA uh, Walt service. So, and again, if, if you just go back to the main themes here, increasing the level, level of abstraction so the services can be used uh, with less effort, so which basically democratizes the whole access to technology piece. And also the second part is partnership the strong partnership between OPC Foundation and Microsoft also entailed other partnerships like uh, Open uh, Manufacturing Platform, which was also announced last week between BMW Group and Microsoft. The words that you're using are interesting. So you increase the level of abstraction and then that does that does that kind of make the technology a little bit more of of a, of a black box at times though, when, when people are trying to or potentially use it, but then that's potentially your role as partners to make it less of a black box for people to understand. That's, that's I, I love that you actually catch caught on that because that was, that's, that's very typical way of, you know, like thinking. But if you just look at the whole computing uh, industry or what we have been doing in the past. I mean, I just like, I need to admit, I've been around for 25 plus years doing computers and my, my first program was on the punch cards uh, and I did assembly level programming. Uh, I did uh, programming on the C, uh, using the C language on the Unix kernel, etc. But the, those don't go away. Uh, the whole point here is that uh, by just providing higher level abstractions, you're letting more people to access technology and do cool stuff. But at the same time, if you want to double click and get, in, get into the details, it is still available, right? So, so hence, uh, it was like the discussion about uh, IoT Hub versus installing Kafka on VMs. You still have the capability for putting together your own service that runs on a different uh, a deployment surface on the cloud, which accepts HTTP connections, and then you can still deal with all of the nitty gritty details. It's still available. However, uh, if your staff is not really capable of doing that, or they don't have uh, the, uh, they are they might be capable, but they may not have the time. Okay. Then your choice is going to go for a higher level service. Take advantage of that so that you don't have to think about the plumbing, and then build new capabilities on top. Interesting. Okay, so. So you can always double click in to look at the plumbing. This is this is a good way of, of explaining it. Okay, so th th I like this a lot. Okay, and then now um, I want you guys to walk us through what it's what it's like for industry to use the cl the Microsoft Cloud. I can't believe it. Like yeah, fifteen years ago, it just seems like. It seems like it just came so quick that now everyone's doing all these different uh, cloud computing technologies and onboarding industry into cloud computing. And 
and sometimes it, it feels like, um, you know, when is this going to come online for like biotechnology, which is a massive um, industry, and and, w- and how will it come online for that? Because IoT seems like it's the big one right now. So. Um, walk us through what it's like to have uh, an industry that gets onboarded with Microsoft because I'm, I'm interested in how this works. So when I when I sign up, I have a certain amount of, like you were explaining, either data or manufacturing. Maybe I have robotics. Maybe I have um, anything in that needs to connect to your cloud for um I'm paying you guys monthly for you to help me with my data, with the an, an analysis of the data, um, with understanding, like you were explaining earlier, with the uh, pre, with predictive maintenance, all these types of things that are helping me save money. So you're even trying to then take something like what is normally um, a cost of paying you monthly, but actually you're saving the company money by giving them the decreases in costs of predictive maintenance and things like that. So can you walk us through a couple like industry examples? Let me back up a little. In very simply, simplistically put, uh, going to the cloud means basically using somebody else's data center, in this case, uh, Azure, right? Uh, of course, that leaves a lot of uh, the complexity. And, and the idea was originally that if you were a manufacturing company and you, had a, a, you have software running in your data centers in your location, they could be back-end systems, PLN systems, um, uh, whatever, manufacturing execution systems, that now with the cloud, you have the option of, of of running it in somebody else's data center. So so the first instinct of everybody was what we call lift and shift, which is to take these applications and instead of running them in, in that machine in my in my location, run it on in Microsoft data center. So so that was now now the the of course, I mean, the first thing is that you don't have to worry about the, the physical machines and the physical space and, and uh, uh, updating the machines and dealing with machines that inevitably break down. You, for, you, you are outsourcing that to Microsoft, and, right? And there's the CapEx versus OpEx. Thing. Right. Uh, uh, so, so, so even for tax purposes, it's a... Uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I, I'll, okay. l- let me... <laughs> uh, so, so the... the and, and also there is the, the, the concept that you don't have to, you don't have to provision hardware for, for your peak. Uh, you, you can scale and f- uh, it's flexible, right? If uh, one year you need, you, you have more projects or more production, uh, you just uh, ramp up more machines and then you ramp them down. So, so it's the elasticity, right? That, and you're, you're, essentially uh, taking advantages of uh, economies of scale, right? Uh, we, we buy machines by the bulk <laughs> and, uh, and uh, we, we operate them in, in very efficient environments. So, so you, uh, you pay less for that, right? So, so there is that. So, so that's, that's the, the first uh, move was, okay, let's move our stuff to, to, to a cloud, right? Now, more and more, the, the independent software vendors are developing cloud-native solutions, right? So, so that, brings, that brings a whole new paradigm. Uh, it, 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 it has enabled what we call software as a service. So, so that's software that not only does it run in the cloud, but basically it's based on subscription. You pay, you pay a subscription. I think the, 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 most, the easiest one to recognize is Office 365, right? You probably noticed that you cannot really buy the, the DVD of Office 365 anymore. You subscribe to it. So that's been uh, enabled in, 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 in a big part by the cloud. So the, the combination of, of offshore, uh, off-sourcing your, your data centers and your hardware and, and, and also enabling new business models where you're actually subscribing to software instead of the, buying the license, uh, that's what manufacturing companies are, are, uh, and companies of, in all industries are, are evolving into. So you want to talk about taxes? <laughs> this is the right time, right? No, I'm not going to talk about taxes. <laughs> it's, it's not a fun discussion. <laughs> yes, because, so the OPEX versus CAPEX discussion is actually interesting and also planning. Uh, so uh, traditionally, when you looked at any typical data center for an enterprise company, uh, it's been 
done in cycles, and the cycles are not in months but years. And what uh, the IT departments have been doing is that they're always planning for the peak, which means that it's inevitable that you're going to have unused capacity in your data center, and you'll be probably paying a lot for just making sure that uh, your business continues running. However, um, with the uh, introducing intru in introducing the cloud environments, uh, what you, now you can do is that you can basically use resources. And I would like to underline the concept of resource, but not the uh, d different units like virtual machines. Resource is a key thing here. Resource means it can be networking. It can be compute in terms of virtual machines. It can be compute in terms of serverless uh, uh, serverless uh, environments. So you don't really think about the server or the virtual machine. All you really think about is, this is the function I want to run. This is the resources it will need in terms of CPU, network, memory, uh, and also higher level services like, um, I don't really care about this is a VM, this is uh, a function or whatnot. What I care about is, I want to process the data in a st streaming data in a way that I want to apply a SQL-like uh, query language on the streaming data, and I, that's all I want to all I want to do. Uh, in order, so just to be able to, or just give, looking at the capability of provisioning such as resource, where you can basically apply a SQL-like query on a streaming data, is actually pre quite profound because there's no equal into it on the CapEx world, other than just buying large machines. Yeah, I'll add a, a few points and kind of just, I think, distill sort of some, some of the fundamentals. So I think, you know, there, there's cloud as an overused word and, and in some respects. And But if I broke it down into sort of from a Microsoft perspective, of course, you know, people historically using things like OneDrive. So obviously that's, you think of cloud storage. Um, of course, Office 365 is obviously, you know, kind of thinking of that subscription motion of using Office products in the cloud. And then, of course, we have Microsoft Azure. And so some of the fundamental things, I think, to land as you think about it, and, and this sort of probably lends itself to the way sort of organizations or companies or depending on the persona you are, think about cloud. So if you're, say, in IT in a company, one of the first things you'll think about is potentially looking at data. So how, you know, as Diego mentioned a little earlier on, thinking about lift and shift. So looking at, you know, you have these things called virtual machines and, and data in the cloud and so on that you can use. So that's one of the m most fundamental primitive things you, you can do. And uh, the, the reason for bringing it up is, you know, that's kind of people generally labor on the point of thinking of cloud as, okay, I can move my data to the cloud. That's kind of one of the things. And it's a very fundamental IT infrastructure type play and that's good. And data becomes a commodity and you think about price point. The other thing, just before I talk about the types of motions across cloud, is to to be really clear of the benefits, right? So when you think about cloud, number one, you're moving to a pay-as-you-go model. So you're not per se moving to a subscription model. You're using to a pay for what you use yeah. model, right? So that that's you know really transformational and fundamental. So if you think about that model, and then the capabilities of being able to have things like virtual machines that you provision. Think about it, you have your PC or your service today in your data centers and be able to say, in a pay for what you use model, you're able to provision hardware that you can run in the cloud of you know, defining things like CPUs, data, and so on. So this is where people need to now sort of understand that it's not just I'm moving data to the cloud, it's now I have computing power in the cloud. And then the third piece is we, of course, provide native services. We have 100 plus services in cloud. So they're all enabling services. It could be thing, everything from driving workflows to uh, even thinking about things like data and analytics. And that's, again, part of our goal when we talk about being able to up-level capabilities is to look at industry and needs and provide capabilities of cloud. So then if you think about that in, in your mode of operation and the personas, it might be I'm the IT guy that says, okay, I'm moving my, my core infrastructure, my data to the cloud. Great, you have that model. It might be your persona is you're a developer, so I'm building on the cloud. So instead of thinking about, and I'll introduce some terminologies now, so instead of thinking about infrastructure as a service, that lift and shift model where I'm just looking at pure sort of you know, capabilities of the cloud, I'm thinking about building on the cloud. And this is where we have a term called platform as a service. So this is where you're now leveraging cloud capabilities as a developer building on the cloud and then releasing your your capabilities to be consumed. 
right? So, so in, in the infrastructure as a service model, really you're responsible for those sets of capabilities, for those virtual machines you're provisioning, you're responsible for things like upgrades and so on and so forth. You have that manageability kind of admin uh, kind of requirements. In platform as a service, that's where those requirements uh, now enable you, if I looked at the developer persona, to be able to build on the cloud, but that we, t we as Microsoft take away the management and the maintainability of the hardware that you're building on the services that you use. And then the third scenario is software as a service. This is consuming services. This is a little, as you think about things like Office 365. So I think as people, you know, I, I talk a lot about transformation. I talk a lot about cloud and people are at different stages. You know, I think people need to evolve and understand that cloud is not just data storage. It's not just OneDrive. It's not just Office 365. It's a paradigm shift. It's a set of capabilities. It's thinking about computing power in the cloud. And depending on your, your persona, you're going to think about it very differently. And then picking up on Ajeng's perspective on that sort of um, capital expenditure versus, versus OPEX. Imagine you're the CIO. You're the CIO of the company that's acquiring companies. Well, number one, it's hard enough to look at a five-year amortization of saying, here's my buying, and, and what does that amortization look like on the hardware? Imagine you're acquiring companies. Then that CIO now has pressure to say, I don't know tomorrow which new, net new companies I'm buying. And then when I do, that, that my plan, my five-year plan on capital expenditure and hardware now is going to be very, very different. Well, imagine a world where in the cloud, you don't have to do that forward planning. In a pay-as-you-go model, you can provision that infrastructure on demand for what you need. That's where the magic starts to come in. This is this is now, you, know, you have almost infinite scale, you pay for what you use, you can scale up, scale down, and it makes that, that planning cycle much, much, much easier, and then it, it flips that CapEx and that OpEx model. So just, again, just, just kind of really wanting to land the point because it's important, I feel, for us to educate the market around what cloud really is beyond thinking about you know, drop locks or OneDrive or data to it's actually much, much more than that. Yeah, that was such a good lesson. I That was a really good one. So I'm happy that you three broke it down like that. The, the, um, one of the first really profound ways of, of shifting was this this mentality of, of, of uh, like elasticity. I really like that word a lot. Um, so then the, the, the industries get to, to, to pay for what they use and they can really, like you said, when they have big periods of increasing their compute. And this is a major part of the future as well. It seems as though... Um, just cloud computing in general and what is being used with, um, the, the, you said there's a hundred plus services that you offer in the cloud. So, you know, then the question is asked, well, what are the services that you provide versus what other cloud computes provide? So then now, what are your proprietary algorithms that you help industry with? And so then who's getting into the, the quantum computing world? Who's going to be offering that as a service? Um, these are all very interesting questions that, that, that we like to um, that we like to ask and get into, into that we like to get into detail um, with. Um, can you guys speak a little bit about the what it looks like you know with 15 years now of of getting industry um involved in cloud computing and then what does these next 15 years potentially look like for uh all of the different offerings that that cloud computing organizations are are going to it seems like quantum computing's in there it seems like trying to use um potentially blockchain technologies in order to make a decentralized version of of of, of the digital ledgers for people to to be able to use, what do you guys think about that? This next sort of period of time. Why don't we go down? So, um, so let me. I think there's a couple of questions in there, and so one was sort of the parity with the cloud vendors. Um, so I guess I'll answer the question this way. I mean, you know, kind of the market is the market, and everyone can kind of take a look at sort of market share and what that looks like. Um, in terms of sort of services and capabilities, this goes back to that fundamental paradigm change that uh, we talked about that we had as a company. So what I feel good about with the Microsoft Azure cloud and when we think about capabilities and services, of course, we're always looking left to right in terms of what other cloud providers are providing. You can, you know, that's kind of a, a given in common business sense. But more importantly, we, of course, look very closely and work with our community. So for example, being here at COFES today. So you know, when we think about delivering capabilities in the cloud and when we think about our planning, that's not done in isolation or in ivory tower. There's a lot of, you know, really uh, working closely with our customers and partners and being involved uh, and, and then being in part of our planning cycle. So 
with all of that, my point is our goal, and I think we do a really, really nice job of this, is that we stay connected to understand, you, know, you hear things about you know, minimal viable product and minimal viable capabilities and so on, and continuous integration and continuous delivery. We do that very, very well. Um, we've actually shifted that over the past few years in terms of the way we deliver software. And of course, you know, a lot of that was driven through how we deliver our cloud platform. So I feel good about our feedback loop we have with the community and how we prioritize the capabilities we deliver. And then I think that's also reflected in when you go look at things like, you know, a good location if people want to look at some some uh, Lighthouse wins, just go to enterprisemicrosoft.com and you'll see some of the customer stories of customers building on the Microsoft Azure cloud. So I feel good about that to sort of answer your question. And we continually look to evolve and, and see what are the set of capabilities we need to deliver that are helping really helping our customers and partners solve those problems. In terms of forward looking, it's kind of always a fun kind of uh, question of what's next. Um, you know, sometimes it's good to look back to say what's next. So, you know, certainly things that are point of mind, uh, if I think about the three things, and I talked about this yesterday, cloud data and AI are sort of things that are point of mind that obviously are pivotal at the moment that are sort of driving transformation. Um, so if I look at sort of the here and now and forward, which is sort of, I think, the evolution of some of those technologies, you know, we're just going to continue to evolve cloud and that's going to you know, continue to grow and you'll see more services and so on and, and expansion number one. Uh, of course, artificial intelligence and augmented reality is, is a hot topic. Um, I think the, the, the big thing, though, is with cloud and capabilities and price point, that's number one. But with the advancements and things like algorithms around artificial intelligence, that's opening up a new generation of just capabilities there. So I think you're going to see much, much more on artificial intelligence. And it's probably one of the most talked about things across all the industries I work on in terms of you know everything from you know thinking about uh, anomaly detection to personalization you know, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, there's lots and lots of great things, even uh, thinking from a development point of view, how do we use artificial intelligence to actually generate software? So there's some really, really cool, interesting things happening, uh, you know, that, that are going beyond sort of PhD and science projects to reality. And I think you have this nice coming together, this intersection of technology and algorithms and capabilities, capabilities that's making this a reality. Uh, you talk about quantum computing, of course, you know, we've made announcements around that. It's obviously the next big thing. And if you kind of Lloyd, look at that. That's going to be super exciting. And we have, uh, obviously, we're working with some of the world renowned leaders on that, of what that looks like. So that's an interesting one to track. Um, blockchain, you also mentioned you'd hit on all the, the, the favorite topics at the moment. I, my, my belief there is it's it's super interesting. Um, as I talked about in the keynote yesterday, the key thing there is going to be the use cases. You know, there's been a lot of confusion between uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain. And so that, I think, is uh, not being good for, for driving forward momentum, but I think that those, the muddying of the waters have cleared around things like blockchain now. And so there's a lot of great work across industries with consortiums that are really sort of thought leaders in the industries thinking through what's the set of problems where this technology might be, be useful. So I think that's really, 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 really interesting. And I think robotics and augmented reality is super interesting as well. So you're know, kind of blaring the lines of, of the two. Yeah, what I will add to that is that one of the things that we're very keen on when it comes to kind of what's coming next uh, in manufacturing and, and technology is is focusing on the worker and 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 this is not just because it's nice to say it is or it, because it's the right thing to do from the societal point of view it's also because it makes sense i mean automation and uh, machine learning and all those cool technologies work best when they augment the human powers. So it's about working with automation, along with automation, instead of automation replacing the human being. So we get sometimes too excited about technology and we want to automate so anything and, and we think that AI is magic. And, and now we, we are sobering up a little bit and, and we are seeing very tangible use cases with machine learning and artificial intelligence and robotics and all that where they're actually saving real dollars and and we we like a lot those applications where where they're incorporating the the human and they're getting the best of both worlds if you try to just ignore it not I mean, it's not only from the point of view of jobs and, and, and skills, which is a very important point. It's just because it makes more sense to augment the, the human powers and rather than to try to replace them with, with technology. 
So in that regard, I think the best um, um, best indication indicator of the future is always the past, right? So looking at the computing story, it's all about. It has always been about uh, access, the uh, capacity, and also uh, the speed. So when the computers first started, it was basically in this huge room with one single computer, probably a few. Um, operators and the only interface was a bunch of papers, right? Uh, just look at how it, it changed over the past. Uh, the access to it uh, started to increase. Uh, the speeds the data get transferred continue to continue to increase. Uh, the access the accessibility of that started to is again continue to increase. What I what we will see, I think, is that we're we're going to have a lot of more a lot more people and things that are connected because the highway, the information highway is much broader. And also with the, cap with the capacity, increased capacity on uh, the overall computing platforms, uh, you mentioned quantum computing. That's one of the other things that it's all about how fast am I going to process the data and run the algorithm so that I can do a good thing. Uh, and it goes back to uh, Diego's point again, that the uh, one thing that we're of course going to be seeing in the future is that I don't know where those numbers come from, but that um, the number of jobs lost to automation mm. versus the new jobs yes. that are going to yes. be created yeah. by automation is some crazy numbers. Yeah. It's not yeah. an yeah. Yeah. elimination of jobs, yeah. it's a displacement. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just like, what was the number? Like 133 million new jobs because of the new technology, something like that. It's, 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 it's fascinating. And the way that people access to technology, the way that we see things going, on, going forward uh, is just, me being the ultimate geek, I cannot be more excited about it. <laughs> There's so many good things there as well. Um, I com I'm a totally uh, in agreement that I think a lot of the um, conversations that are happening around a job loss, I think, is very important to realize that it takes so many designers and engineers and cloud computing architects to be able to uh, to piece together the new age that's being put together. But how do we retrain the f the millions of jobs that are that are in the um, the driving and the and the retail and service industry? How do they get retrained into these positions? Is a very uh, uh, difficult thing to to to, fit, to figure out. There's so many other things that you guys talked about in there. The three words: cloud, data, and AI, and where where we're going with that. I really appreciate it. I didn't get to touch on this, but when you explained a platform as a service, it's very interesting to think about someone being able to take their own proprietary compute, putting it up on your cloud, and then offering that to other people. That's a whole new. You're acting as like a marketplace as well um, for people to put up their own uh, stores in the cloud, basically for people to access. That's that's very interesting, and then. Of course, on the on the um, on the actual augmenting uh, work side of things, this is very key. You can actually save real dollars by um, by augmenting work instead of replacing it, um, and all these new jobs that are opening up, as, as we said. And then just on the on the on the decentralization side of things, I also am very fascinated by if, as we go into the computing, uh, the quantum computing cloud world, is are we going to see companies like Microsoft, like Google, that are at the forefront of these industries? Are we gonna have silos of cloud computing? Are we gonna open up the algorithms for um, for going across these silos for people to use? Um, do you guys have any last thoughts about, you know, about that little bit? So, I mean, in terms of kind of the algorithms and opening up, I mean, I, I think that's already there I mean, today. And I think, I think yeah, absolutely. Can we explain? Yeah, explain. Uh, yeah, and we'll kind of pass it along. Um, and so, I mean, I think that's why you're seeing such a thriving e ecosystem around artificial intelligence is the sharing of the algorithms and that people can can leverage that. Um, and I think I think touched upon it uh, earlier on as well as that, um, you know, we are the largest contributor to open source uh, there. But I'll, I'll pass along and we can kind of share some thoughts on that. Yeah, you guys do a lot of open source work. You were indicating that earlier. Yeah. Yes, yes, and it's, uh, the uh, acquisition of GitHub by Microsoft is actually a very interesting uh, indicator of that. Uh, so uh, Microsoft's culture has been changing, yes, and it's all been uh, changing towards being more open, providing uh, access to um, uh, the those technologies that were not accessible before. So another example here is that, um, so first of all, just 
full, full disclosure, I'm not a lawyer, right? So what I'm going to tell is about some law related, law related, related stuff, but it's actually very important for the startups and for new businesses. Um, Microsoft has a new service called uh, Azure IP Protection. So this is all about an IP, just pretty much like any other acronym. It does not uh, mean that it's internet protocol, it's intellectual property. Uh, it's all about um, Microsoft opening up um, patents that are really important and key for the technology to thrive and letting the use of those patents uh, available. Uh, Microsoft also expanded IP protection uh, services to the startups, which allows the startups to uh, not to be afraid of the, their, so there's an interesting term for that and I love it, it's not patent trolls, it's non-practicing entities which are equivalent, by the way. So those people, those companies who, that nece who, who just happen to have ownership of a patent, but not necessarily producing anything on top of that, so they're not practicing anything uh, using that patent. Um, this, um, that setup actually may prevent a lot of up and coming startups and businesses that can solve new problems to just hold back because they're afraid of being sued by those entities. And and then and, and they cannot go forward for forward with interesting solutions, just because of the legal problems. So those two things, the IP protection and Microsoft opening up those patents, are actually amazing contributions to the community, uh, who want to do uh, additional work on top of the existing uh, intellectual property. That is that is it. Thank you so much for joining us. Diego, Erjank, Paul, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. I feel like I have been more, really well, more well informed now about what's happening in cloud and hopefully for everyone that's tuning in as well. We greatly appreciate you tuning in and give us your thoughts in the comments below about everything that was described about Microsoft's cloud computing, Azure and more. Go share it with other people. We'd love to hear the more conversations happening around the world about this up and coming technology huge shout out to kofes kofes's links are below as well and go and build the future everyone manifest your dreams into the world support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in our links are below as well thanks everyone for tuning in and we will see you soon